U.S. Trotskyism, the Socialist Workers' Party in the Difficult 1950s. This is from Robert J. Alexander's History of International Trotskyism. The Socialist Workers' Party's thesis on theses on the American Revolution, to the contrary notwithstanding, the United States did not suffer in the wake of World War II a new economic depression worse than that of the 1930s. There began instead a sustained period of economic growth and widespread improvement of living levels of large elements of the working class. Nor did the American working class move steadily and rapidly to the left, culminating in a revolutionary upsurge as the Socialist Workers' Party had predicted. Rather, the 1950s were a decade of conservatism and even reaction in many ways. The first Republican to occupy the White House in 20 years, Dwight Eisenhower, was there, with the votes of many working men during most of the decade. During much of it, too, there was a current of demagogic reaction epitomized by, by but not confined to, Senator Joseph McCarthy, who <clears throat> also enjoyed the backing of all too many workers. The Socialist Workers' Party suffered setbacks during the 1950s as a consequence of these and other factors. Fred Stanton has summed up the party's situation thus, quote, the failure of the Western European revolutions and economic predominance, the economic predominance of the United States internationally enabled American big business to make wage concessions to workers in this country. And the strike wave, and in collaboration with the union bureaucrats, impose a witch hunt and begin preparations for a new war against the Soviet Union, dot, dot, dot. These factors cut off the growth of the Socialist Workers' Party in that period. Many of the blacks and unionists recruited during and shortly after the war dropped out, and it was not until the new rise of the black struggle and the colonial revolutions of the 1960s, especially Cuba and Vietnam, that, par that the party began to grow again, end quote. Stanton might have added that in addition to its other woes, the Socialist Workers' Party suffered one significant split early in the decade and another less consequential split at the end of the period. On balance, the 1950s were a period of retrogression for Trotskyism in the United States. The SWP and the Witch Hunting of the 1950s It was the Communist Party which suffered the bulk of the anti-radical persecution and prosecution by various arms of the government during the late 1940s and early 1950s. The Trotskyists were not without their victims as well. There is no record of how many members of the Socialist Workers' Party were deprived of their passports and were subjected to other kinds of disabilities and annoyances, although there were certainly a considerable number of such cases. During this period, there was one instance involving a member of the Socialist Workers' Party which gained nationwide publicity and aroused a wide range of support outside the ranks of the Trotskyists. This was that of James Kutcher. He was a member of the Newark, New Jersey branch of the Socialist Workers' Party who had been drafted into the army during World War II and had lost both of his legs fighting in Italy. Thereafter, he was fitted with artificial legs and was able to work getting a job with the Veterans Administration in his home city. However, with the issuance of the Attorney General's List in 1948, upon which the Socialist Workers' Party appeared as one of the, quote, subversive, end quote, organizations, Kutcher was dismissed by the Veterans Administration. Kutcher fought the case, and Kutcher and the Socialist Workers' Party were able to muster wide backing from non-party organizations and individuals in the labor movement and elsewhere. Meanwhile, Kutcher continued to be subjected to... other petty but painful kinds of persecution, a move to evict his parents with whom he lived from a public housing project, and a move to cancel Kutcher's disability pension on grounds of his belonging to the Socialist Workers' Party. All of these cases were finally won either by administrative appeal or through the courts. 
1956, Kutcher was restored to his job with the Veterans Administration with full back pay. Meanwhile, the Socialist Workers' Party had denounced the, quote, anti-communist, end quote, demagoguery of Senator Joseph McCarthy. Typical of their attacks on McCarthyism was the statement in their draft resolution on the political situation in America, published in September 1954, about the time the career of the Wisconsin senator reached its peak. The party wrote at that time that, quote, as a product of the witch hunt, McCarthyism continues to set the pace for the hysteria, but it is more than a witch hunt, excuse me, a witch hunting excrescence of the, Ameri of the, excuse me, of the capitalist state apparatus. It is a Native American fascist movement in the early stage of formation. Having stepped out on the political arena as the murderous foe of the working class, it will not be subdued or contained by the old capitalist parties, even though they fake, excuse me, they take fright, or by the well-meaning liberals or by any other force except the working class itself, end quote. Not long after this, Senator McCarthy was in fact censored by the Senate for his behavior during the so-called Army McCarthy hearings. In the face of the prosecution of most of the top leaders of the Communist Party under the Smith Act, the Socialist Workers' Party offered the Communist Party its support. The Trotskyites took this position in spite of the fact that several years before, the Stalinists had cheered on the federal authorities in their prosecution of the Trotskyists under the same legislation. Soon after the, par the first indictments against Communist Party leaders in 1949, James Cannon addressed a protest meeting in New York City explaining the Socialist Workers' Party position. Cannon noted that, quote, this is not a criminal trial. Me. Of alleged actions in violation of definite constitutional laws. This is a political trial. The freedom to, quote, advocate, end quote, any doctrine, including revolution, is basic to free speech and democracy. This trial strikes at the very roots of these democratic rights of all workers' organizations, end quote. A bit later, Cannon added that, quote, if the precedent established in our case is reinforced by another conviction in this case of the Stalinists, and sanctioned by public opinion until it becomes accepted as custom, the traditional freedoms which the workers' movement needs for enlightened advancement will yield to new encroachments all along the line. The ominous trend toward thought control under a police state will be greatly accelerated, end quote. In spite of the Socialist Workers' Party's support of the Communists being prosecuted, the Stalinists in no way reciprocated. The Stalinists did not even answer overtures from the Socialist Workers' Party proposing a united front between the two groups and others to fight prosecutions under the Act. The Cochranite Split Origins of the Cochranite Split The reactionary atmosphere of the early 1950s may have frightened away some of the more timid members of the Socialist Workers' Party and may have discouraged other people from joining such a, quote, subversive, end quote, group. However, the negative impact on the Socialist Workers' Party of the official and unofficial anti-radical phobia was nowhere near as great as was the split which took place in 1953. This was the most serious schism since the Schachtmanite break in 1940, the gravest the Socialist Workers' Party was to suffer between 1940 and the early 1980s. In some respects, the Cochranite split was even more serious than that of the Shackmanites because the Cochranite split largely deprived the Socialist Workers' Party of its base in organized labor. What came to be known as the, quote, Cochranites, end quote, consisted in fact of at least two groups, which had joined together to fight the majority of the leadership of the Socialist Workers' Party. One of these was made up principally of trade union cadres in the Midwest, particularly in Michigan, Michigan and Ohio, as well as some people from the West Coast. The other element was led by George Clark and Milton, Milton Zaslow. 
Mike Bartel, and was centered in New York City. Although there was coincidence in the outlook and inclination of these two oppositionist elements, they were two distinct groups, and the starting point of their dissidents with the majority was distinctly different. As the factional dispute developed, most of the controversies in the factional documents of both the majority and the minority tended to focus on the issues raised by the Clark Zaslow group. However, in many ways, the criticisms of the Socialist Workers' Party and of Trotskyism in general by the Cochrane Trade Unionist contingent were more fundamental, both as challenges to the doctrines of the Fourth International and in terms of their representing the outlook of most of the party's leading, leading trade unionists, who, when they finally abandoned the Socialist Workers' Party, took most of its remaining working-class cadres with them. The Cochranite Trade Unionists The Cochranite Trade Unionists included most of the Socialist Workers' Party leaders in the United Auto Workers in Flint and Detroit, as well as auto workers and others in the Toledo, Toledo and Cleveland areas, the party people in the United Rubber Workers in and around Akron, and Harry Braverman and other, others active in the United States. United States excuse me, not in the, others active in the United Steelworkers in the Youngstown area. They were all members of the Ohio slash Michigan district of the Socialist Workers Party. As fellow Trotskyists active in the labor movement in the same general part of the country, they had developed more or less close contacts with one another during and right after World War II. However, it was not until April 1949 that they began to function as a, quote, tendency, end quote, within the party. By that time, Bert Cochran, who, during and after the war, was chairman of the Trade Union Committee of the Socialist Workers' Party, had come to the conclusion that a split in the party was inevitable. Bert Cochran had come to feel that it was necessary for the Socialist Workers' Party to break out of being a sect to form a wider organization without narrow ideological doctrines in which one was required to believe. At the same time, Bert Cochran had become convinced that it would not be possible to have really meaningful discussions, let alone debates, within the Socialist Workers' Party on the kinds of issues Bert Cochran, sorry, my computer's doing something. Well, saving a file for another video. Christos Mamos on anarchist and council communist responses to the Soviet Union, or to the Russian Revolution, rather. Early Russian Revolution. Sue me. At the same time, Bert Cochran had become convinced that it would not be possible to have really meaningful discussions, let alone debates, within the Socialist Workers' Party on the kinds of issues Bert Cochran wanted to raise. Nor did Bert Cochran have any illusions that Bert Cochran and his friends would be able to capture the Socialist Workers' Party, the hold of Cannon and Cannon's associates on the party apparatus being too strong for that. Although the Cochranites had developed their organization by 1949, it was several years before the split in the Socialist Workers' Party developed. The split came about as the culmination of a number of incidents and controversies. In many ways, the growing disenchantment of the Cochranite labor group with Cannon and other principal Socialist Workers' Party figures was quite unexpected and must have been particularly disheartening for Cannon himself. Until the schism began to develop, the trade union group around Bert Cochran had been among the most loyal supporters of the party leadership, and Cochran had the reputation of being the strongest, quote, Canaanite, end quote, of them all. The first clash came in 1948. The clash originated in Akron, where Jules Geller, the principal Trotskyist among the rubber workers, sought party permission to make an alliance with Stalinists in the United Rubber Workers to resist the purge of communist partiers being undertaken by the Union's right wing. 
Geller and others felt that once the Stalinists had been purged, the Trotskyists would be next. He also felt that the Trotskyists, with their strength mainly in the Akron area, and the Stalinists, with influence in smaller locals in New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut, stood a good, good chance of defeating the efforts of those trying to purge the Stalinists. Geller and others wanted to have the party adopt a general policy of alliance with communists in the CIO unions, including the United Auto Workers and National Maritime Workers, in which union leaders were moving against the Stalinists. This proposal was denounced as, quote, softness towards Stalinism, end quote, and was rejected, although in the particular case of the United Rubber Workers, Geller was allowed to work with the Stalinists. Subsequently, the party also allowed United Auto Worker Trotskyist Unionists to work with the R.J. Thomas's Communist Party faction against the efforts of Walter Reuther to remove them from union leadership. Meanwhile, the Cochranites were beginning to have serious doubts about the general political orientation of the Socialist Workers' Party and the fundamental nature of the party. They began to argue that the Socialist Workers' Party should give up the perception of being a vanguard party in which the immediate future was going to lead U.S. workers in revolution and become instead an educational group, trying both to educate themselves and the workers. Increasingly, they, <coughs> me. Increasingly, they felt that the Socialist Workers' Party had become a sect. They came to feel that the vanguard party slash democratic centralism concept, although it might have been appropriate at one time in Tsarist Russia, was not appropriate in the democratic atmosphere of the United States. Here they felt there was need for an open party which could study the real situation in this country and the world. In retrospect, the Cochranite trade unionists began to have regrets that they had not supported the position of Albert Goldman and Felix Morrow in the immediate post-war period. The Cochranites became convinced that Goldman and Morrow, in their criticism of the apocalyptic viewpoint concerning impending world economic depression and very proximate revolution in the United States, which had been adopted by the Socialist Workers' Party in 1946, had been correct. They came to regard the expulsion of the Goldman slash Morrow group as having confirmed the evolution of the Socialist Workers' Party into a sect which had begun with the expulsion of the Schachtmanites in 1940. They questioned, the Cochranites questioned what they, had, what they came to see as a purely mechanical application of Marx's ideas to the mid-20th century United States. Although they in no sense repudiated Marx, they increasingly called for a restudy of his ideas to determine which ones were still valid and which were not applicable 65 years after his death. On a tactical level, the Cochranite labor people had strong disagreements with the majority of the party leadership, and it was perhaps here that their coincidence with the Clark Zaslow group was closest. The Cochran tendency felt that the Socialist Workers' Party ought to orient its attention more generally toward those in and around the Communist Party. They had concluded that there were quite a few Stalinists, particularly among their trade unionists, who were disgusted with the Communist Party's frequent cha changes in line and were willing to discuss new ideas. The Socialist Workers' Party trade unionists concluded that the best recruiting ground for the party was to be found among the labor people in the Communist Party and its periphery. But the Socialist Workers' Party leadership rejected this tactic as being, quote, soft on Stalinism, end quote. The Clark Zaslow Tendency in any case, the Cochranites needed allies in their growing conflict with the Canaanites, although Cannon denounced their alliance with the Clark Zaslow group as being, quote, unprincipled, end quote, Cochran certainly did not consider it as such. Both groups consisted of veterans of the movement, they had certain common objectives to the Cannon leadership, and although they had differing perspectives on a number of issues, Cochrane did not see anything, quote, unprincipled, end quote, in their forming a block against that leadership. 
In the early 1950s, the Cochranite trade unionists had joined forces with the party with George Clark, backed by Milton Zaslow, at that point the organizer of the Socialist Workers' Party local in New York City. Clark had for several years been the Socialist Workers' Party's representative on the International Secretariat of the Fourth International. In that capacity, he had become friendly both personally and politically with Michel Pablo, the secretary of the International. It was through this connection that the Fourth International ultimately became involved in the 1953 split in the Socialist Workers' Party. Clark had been the Socialist Workers' Party's, quote, fraternal delegate, end quote, to the Third World Congress of the Fourth International in 1951. In that capacity, Clark had been commissioned by the Socialist Workers' Party leadership to suggest certain amendments accepted by the Socialist Workers' Party Political Committee to a proposed document circulated before the meeting on, quote, international perspectives, end quote. However, instead of doing so, Clark reported that he had burned the document from the Socialist Workers' Party because he was, quote, ashamed, end quote, to present it to the Congress. Clark's action seems not to have aroused very great repercussions within the Socialist Workers' Party at the time. Subsequently, when he returned to the United States shortly after the Third World Congress, Clark began to indicate that Clark had differences with the positions of the majority of the Socialist Worker Party leadership. These differences were significant for two reasons. First, the differences represented important alterations of the Trotskyist position on the nature of the Soviet Union and the Stalinist movement. Second, in pressing them, Clark and his friends claimed, as it turned out, with some justification, that they were reflecting the ideas of Michel Pablo and the Fourth International Secretary, excuse me, and the International Secretary of the Fourth International. As a consequence, Pablo is brought directly into the internal conflict in the Socialist Workers' Party, and the split proved to be but a prelude to the split in the Fourth International. We deal elsewhere with the split in the International. Here it is sufficient to note the major positions put forth by Clark within the Socialist Workers' Party. The pressure of events, Clark argued, had resulted in the masses forcing the Stalinist leadership in the Soviet Union and other Stalinist-controlled countries to adopt a more revolutionary position. Instead, therefore, of being the major impediment to the revolution, the Stalinists had been forced to become revolutionary. They had, in fact, carried through revolutionary changes in Eastern Europe, establishing workers' states in Eastern Europe however distorted by their ruling bureaucracies, and had carried out new revolutions in China, North Korea, and elsewhere. Clark, Zaslow, Bartel, and their associates found confirmation of their arguments in events following Stalin's death. At that point, the Stalinist leadership was forced by the masses to make fundamental changes in the economy to improve living standards, they argued. In East Germany, in the face of the uprisings of June 1953, the Stalinists reacted by combining extensive concessions with the action of Soviet troops against the rebels instead of relying on only on brute force, as in the past. As a consequence, Clark suggested that the classical Trotskyist perspective with regard to the Soviet Union should be altered. Instead of continuing to insist that only a political revolution in the USSR would end the deformation of the Soviet workers' state, the Trotskyists must admit the possibility that the end of bureaucratic control of the Soviet Union might come either through political revolution, a series of continuing reformist concessions by leaders of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, quote, or a combination of the two, end quote. In terms of practical Trotskyist policy in the United States, Clark, Zaslow, Bartel, and others argued that the changing situation within the Stalinist ranks 
and the reactionary atmosphere of general U.S. politics called for a change in orientation. The Socialist Workers' Party should concentrate its attention largely on those who were already radicalized, which in practical terms meant those in the Communist Party and the Communist Party's periphery. The Majority Group if the minority opposition in the 1952-53 to factional struggle in the Socialist Workers' Party was made up of two more or less clearly defined groups, the majority was even more heterogeneous. After short initial hesitation, the leadership in the majority was taken by James Cannon, who early in the struggle had moved to California from New York. Associated with him from the beginning was a group led by Murray Weiss, consisting in large part of young people recruited into the party right after World War II. In New York, much of the struggle was carried on by Joseph Hansen, George Novak, Morris Stein, and George Brightman, men, of a, gen men a generation younger than Cannon who had risen to leadership in the Socialist Workers' Party in the 1920s. The first three in particular carried on much of the polemicizing with Clark and Zaslow as well as conducting the factional fight in the key New York local of the party, where Zaslow was at first in control of the party apparatus. Apparently one group which at first hesitated in the dispute but finally joined the majority was the element led by Farrell Dobbs, the former Minnesota Teamster Union leader. Farrell Dobbs perhaps felt some sympathy for the fellow trade unionists in the Cochranite group and was anxious to prevent a split with them. Subsequent to Dobbs joining forces with Cannon in the struggle, the latter wrote Vincent Dunn that Dobbs, quote, thought it, thought it seems, we were hell-bent on organizing a factional fight in the party without consulting him and before the party members, or even a consideration considerable section of the leading cadre, were convinced by of the depths and seriousness of the conflict. Dobbs said said he had not intended his memorandum to the PC as a declaration of political neutrality. As we told him frankly, we had interpreted it but only as a means of slowing down the organizational sides side of the internal the organizational side of the internal conflict, end quote. The majority, or its principal spokesman, Cannon, Hansen, Novak, relied principally on reiteration of the classic Trotskyist position to rebut the minority. They continued to insist that the Stalinist bureaucracy in the Soviet Union and elsewhere constituted the major impediment to the spread of the world revolution because of their desire to compromise with, quote, imperialism, end quote. They also continued to insist that the only way in which the Stalinist bureaucracy would be ousted from control of the USSR and other degenerate and deformed worker states would be through political revolution as Trotsky had insisted almost two decades earlier. Progress of the Schism Although there had been some jousting between the two sides even before then, the factional struggle broke out, broke out in earnest at the beginning of 1953. Organizer Zaslow Bartel submitted a document entitled, quote, Report and Tasks, end quote, to the New York local for discussion in connection with the local's forthcoming convention. Zaslow Bartel summarized his position by noting that, quote, the changes in our general approach here in New York can be summed up as follows. We shifted the axis of our activities from the general mass of politically in uninitiated workers to a narrower but more selective audience of left-wing groups, politically-minded workers and intellectuals, and student youth from expansion of our organization and activities to retrenchment and more modest tasks, end quote. At that time, Joseph Hansen reported that, quote, Cochran, Clark, Bartell, and Frankel 
bracket, Harry Braverman, end bracket, are functioning as a common faction under Cochrane's leadership. Up to this point, there is only one proposition to which they have agreed among themselves. This is the proposal that the party's activities and resources be channelized into propaganda work. They want a committee set up to devote full time to applying Marxism to the American scene, end quote. This report set off a vigorous, if not violent, discussion not only in New York City, but throughout the Socialist Workers' Party. In May 1953, a plenum of the National Committee agreed upon a truce. As Cannon subsequently described it, quote, That proposal which we offered to them and which they finally accepted was nothing new, dot, dot, dot. That is, they that they remain in the party and retain all normal rights. They could have a limited discussion after the convention in the magazine. They could have representation on the leading bodies according to their strength on the condition that they accept the decisions of the convention and remain, quote, lo to me, remain loyal, end quote. Cannon added that, quote, the resolution placed no restrictions on further discussion, end quote. However, difficulties arose following the May plenum as representatives of both sides reported back to local unions of the units of the party. Relations became increasingly tense as it became clear that the two factions had greatly different points of view. A small incident reflects the depth of the chasm which had developed between the Cochranites and the majority of the Socialist Workers' Party leadership. Jules Geller, one of the Cochranite leaders, had been a particularly close friend of George Novak, one of the principal spokesmen for the majority point of view. At one point, not long before the final split of the Cochranites from the party, George Novak came to visit Jules Geller, seeking to bridge the gap between them. After some preliminary discussion, Novak put the question, Do you still believe that the Socialist Workers' Party is destined to lead the revolution? in the United States, end quote. When Geller answered in the negative, Novak commented that, quote, there is nothing left to discuss, end quote. Years later, Geller's opinion was that that indeed had been the case. In August 1953, the minority lost control of the party apparatus in New York City at a city convention. Finally, at the end of October, the minority, quote, provoked, end quote, its expulsion from the Socialist Workers' Party. They organized a boycott of a celebration of the 25th anniversary of the expulsion of Cannon, Shackman, and Abern from the Communist Party and the establishment of the Trotskyist movement in the United States. which, quote, coincided in New York with the wind-up rally in our election campaign, the best we ever had, end quote, according to Ken. As a consequence of that action, a few days later, the 25th anniversary plenum of the Socialist Workers' Party voted to suspend all minority members of the National Committee. They could win reinstatement, the resolution said, if, quote, the boycott of our 25th anniversary celebration was disavowed, end quote. The dissidents did not ask for reinstatement. Assessment of the Cochranite Split Several questions are posed by the Cochranite Split in the Socialist Workers' Party. One of these concerns whether the schism was over issues of principle. David Hershoff, who broke from the Socialist Workers' Party with the Cochranites, writing a quarter of a century later to one of the editors of the Socialist Workers' Party Weekly, the militant, commented that, quote, the split of 1963 was between, I think it might be, it's supposed to be 53, the split of 50, I'll just read what it says. I don't know what the... Maybe there's also a 1963 split. Anyway, writing a quarter of a century later to one of the editors of the Socialist Workers 
Party Weekly, the militant commented that, quote, the split of 1963 was between revolutionists and was therefore unprincipled. It was not, as you wildly assert, a split between revolutionists on the one side and Gompersite unionists on the other, end quote. Later in the same letter, he added that, quote, the split of 1953 was unprincipled and perhaps avoidable, end quote. This analysis seems somewhat doubtful. Both elements which made up the Cochranite faction, Clark and Zaslow, on the one hand, and the trade unionists around Cochrane, on the other, had fundamental disagreements with the Canaanite leadership. Clark and Zaslow largely accepted, quote, Pabloism, that is, the belief that conditions had changed so as to make it possible for the Stalinist parties once more to become, quote, revolutionary, end quote, and that it therefore behooved the Trotskyists to work within the Stalinist milieu, and if possible, within the Stalinist parties themselves. On the other hand, the dissidence of Cochrane and his immediate allies was even more profound. They had developed severe doubts about the very nature of the Trotskyist movement, the appropriateness of the Bolshevik type of revolutionary organization in the American context, and the role of the Fourth International as, quote, the party of the world revolution, end quote. It is hard to see how either of these elements of the opposition could ultimately have compromised with the official Trotskyist movement. A second question concerned the significance of the split for the Socialist Workers' Party and generally for Trotskyism in the United States. There seemed little doubt that the defection of the Cochranites was an exceedingly severe blow for the U.S. Trotskyist movement, probably a more significant split than the somewhat larger one of 1940. To start with, the Cochranites took with them an estimated 25% of the Socialist Workers' Party membership. Even more important was the nature of those who defected. David Hershoff, excuse me, Harrisoff, no, Harrisoff, <laughs> has written the, the author that, quote, the basic support for Cochrane and the Socialist Workers' Party was in the party factions in auto, steel, and rubber. After the split, the Socialist Workers' Party had to rebuild its organization in Michigan practically from scratch. Until their turn towards industrial colonization about three years ago, the Socialist Workers' Party tended to concentrate their efforts on social movements which had their main strength outside the factories." End quote. Furthermore, the victory of the majority in the 1953 struggle did not preclude further struggles within the party. Harishoff wrote to Frank Lovell that the majority in 1953, quote, agreed, dot, 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 on the cockeyed notion that the country was entering a class confrontation between fascism on the march and the proletariat, dot, dot, dot. Events quickly demonstrated the error of the prognosis, dot, dot, dot. The bloc of the victors succeeded to, excuse me, proceeded to fall apart. Weiss, Swabick, Schultz, Marcy, Stein, Bolden, Fraser, Kay went their separate ways. The Socialist Workers' Party barely made it into the 1960s. End quote. The third issue raised by the Cochranite split was its effect on the Fourth International. There can be little doubt about the fact that it was per the close association of the Cochranites, particularly Clark, with the International Secretariat headed by Pablo, which finally convinced Cannon and others who had first rejected the suggestion when made by leaders of other members, excuse me, of other member parties, that, quote, Pabloism, end quote, was a reality and was leading the Fourth International in a fundamentally revisionist direction, which the Socialist Workers' Party leaders could not accept. Later History of the Cochranites Once outside the Socialist Workers' Party, most of the Cochranites organized as the Socialist Union. They began to publish the American Socialist. It sought to be a periodical open to people of widely different orientations. Although most of the articles were written by members of the group, among outside contributors such excuse me, among the outside contributors were Michael Harrington, uh, who was initiated the uh, Democratic Socialists of America, um, then the youth leader of the Shackmanites, 
and W.E.B. Du Bois, the black leader who is on his way towards affiliating with the Communist Party. Although the minority had the support of the Fort International leadership and of Michel Pablo personally, in their factional fight, quote, within three or four months, the Socialist Union broke with the International Secretariat. No sooner had the split occurred than the International Secretariat tried to patch things up between themselves, the Socialist Workers' Party, and the Cochranites. Neither the Socialist Workers' Party nor the Cochranites were in mood for reconciliation. We regarded the Socialist Workers' Party as hopelessly sectarian. The new Socialist Labor Party, or SLP, I don't know what that stands for. I suppose that's... What it means. <laughs> Excuse me. We regarded the Socialist Workers Party as hopelessly sectarian. The new SLP, we called it, the Socialist Workers Party, saw us as a combination of capitulators to Stalinism and to the Reuther wing of the CIO officialdom. End quote. When reconciliation among the Canaanites, Cochranites, and Pablo became clearly impossible, Pablo proposed to Cochran that the Socialist Union organize as the U.S. section of the International Secretariat faction of the Fourth International. However, Cochran and most of the other leaders of the Socialist Union rejected this idea, viewing it as being merely the reestablishment of the kind of sect they had eschewed in breaking with the Socialist Workers' Party. The Socialist Union never became a part of the Pobloite faction of the Fourth International. The Cochranites came to concentrate most of their attention on publishing their periodical. However, David Harishoff has noted that, quote, its primary constituency was in the Socialist Workers' Party's CIO fractions. The opportunities For left activity in the unions was declining in those years, as was the audience for Marxist ideas. The group was vulnerable to demoralization in discouraging conditions because it lacked the sectarian conviction that history had ordained it to lead the revolution. End quote. At the same, t excuse me, at the time of the upheaval in the Communist Party, resulting from Khrushchev's speech to the Twentieth Congress of the Communist Party Soviet Union and the revolt in Hungary in 1956, the Socialist Union at first saw an opportunity for bringing into its ranks those who had broken with the Communist Party USA. Cochrane had extensive conversations with Joseph Starobin and John Gates, two of the principal Communist Party dissenters. However, because of a combination of circumstances, including still lingering prejudices of the Communist dissidents against Trotskyists, or even ex Trotskyists, nothing came of these negotiations. In 1957, the Socialist Union suffered a split. In New York City, a group led by Zaslow and Irving Bynan broke away to join forces with the remnants of the American Labor Party and the group around The Guardian, and for a while, Bynan became editor of The Guardian. At this time, George Clark also broke with the Socialist Union. The major significance of the split-off of the clark Zaslow element was that it deprived the Socialist Union and the American Socialist Journal of important financial resources. Meanwhile, most of the work of putting out the American Socialists fell on Cochran, Jules Geller, and Harry Braverman. The last two became increasingly unhappy with Cochrane's editorials and other writings, at one point accusing him of being, quote, another Walter Lippmann, end quote, merely commenting on events without interpreting them in a socialist fashion. At the same time, Braverman and Geller had developed increasingly close relations with the group which put out Monthly Review, led by Paul Sweezy and Leo Huberman. They felt that Sweezy and Huberman, although coming out of the periphery of the Communist Party, were raising the same kinds of questions concerning the adaptation of Marxist ideas to the U.S. scene as were those people involved in the American Socialist. 
And as a consequence, it was decided in the fall of 1959 to dissolve the Socialist Union and suspend publication of the American Socialist. I'm going to take a break here. Socialist Workers' Party Electoral Activity During the 1950s, the Socialist Workers' Party began to engage on a substantial scale in a kind of political activity in which the Trotskyists had participated very little. This was the running of candidates in general elections, both on the presidential level and in states and localities where they had a sufficient membership to launch what they considered effective campaigns. Previous to the 1950s, the Trotskyists had only occasionally run nominees for public office. One instance which we have noted was the candidacy of Grace Carlson for senator in Minnesota in 1940. At the time, the New Socialist Workers' Party had a relatively large following in the state, principally based on their influence in the Teamsters and the Minneapolis labor movement. In 1958, Cannon explained in a speech in Los Angeles why the Socialist Workers' Party had begun running candidates wherever this was feasible. Cannon noted that the job of the party was to, quote, speak up for socialism, end quote, and that, quote, the best time of all, the most fruitful time to explain socialism, is during election campaigns when public interest is highest and we stand the best chance to get a hearing. The capitalist class rules this country in a complicated way through the machinery of bourgeois democracy. They can't shut off all avenues of public communication, even to minority parties, although they try their best, end quote. James Cannon. Cannon men maintained that, quote, the Socialist Workers' Party, even with its limited forces, has demonstrated in these recent years how we can get through cracks in the wall and compel them to give us access to television and radio audiences and to carry notices in the newspaper. Newspapers. We get a greater hearing for the ideas of socialism in the few months of the election campaign than in all the rest of the time put together. This makes every election campaign a socialist success. End quote. The Socialist Workers' Party leader concluded, quote, The main purpose of participating in elections as a socialist organization or as a coalition of socialist organizations is to take full advantage of the expanded opportunity to make socialist propaganda, dot, dot, dot. More people will be listening than at any time in recent decades, end quote. James Buchanan. George Brightman has written that, quote, during the 1950s, electoral activity was an important arena for the Socialist Workers' Party, especially because McCarthyism and the Cold War isolation shut off so many other arenas. In addition to presidential elections, there were Socialist Workers' Party candidates for Congress, state, and local offices in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Illinois, Wisconsin, Washington, California, Minnesota, just to mention places I recall from memory. In 1952, there was Farrell Dobbs for president and Myra Tanner Weiss for vice president. They also ran for those posts in 1956 and 1960, end quote. George Brightman. The Socialist Workers' Party and the Events of 1956 During 1956, a series of events took place which greatly heartened Socialist Workers' Party leaders and members. The first was the speech by Nikita Khrushchev, Khrushchev to the 20th Congress of the Soviet Communist Party in March, in which he denounced Stalin in a way that only Stalin's worst enemies, including the Trotskyists, had done there to four. Khrushchev's speech was followed some six months later by the uprisings in Poland and Hungary. Finally, all of these events provoked the beginning of the most serious crisis in the U.S. Communist Party since the fall of J. Lovestone in 1929. In addition to giving new encouragement to the Trotskyists, these events seemed to confirm everything that they had been saying for almost 30 years. They caused the Socialist Workers' Party to alter, at least for a time, some of the analysis and dogma which had been standard since the early 1930s. 
Finally, the split in the Communist Party seemed to open up new political possibilities for the Socialist Workers' Party. A few weeks after the Communist Party of the, excuse me, the CPSU, Soviet, excuse me, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union's 20th Congress, Cannon gave a speech in Los Angeles in which he explained his interpretation of Khrushchev's revelations. Cannon asked the question, quote, Why do these bureaucrats speak out now, three years after the death of Stalin, and begin to tell a part of the truth about the horrible regime? Is it because they have suddenly turned honest or are no longer afraid? End quote. Cannon answered his second question by saying that, quote, There have been some concessions and some reforms, no question about that, but there has been no basic change in the bureaucratic regime of special privileges for a minority and hard times for the majority established under Stalin. The bureaucracy has all the privileges. The workers have no rights and no freedom, and anybody who says they do lies. There is no such thing as free a free worker in the Soviet Union under Khrushchev any more than there was under Stalin, end quote. James P. Cannon. Cannon added that, quote, the workers have to get that freedom for themselves, end quote, and then went on to give his explanation for Khrushchev's speech, quote, The irresistible pressure of the Soviet workers was the power behind the 20th Congress. That, comrades, is the key to an understanding of what is taking place. The bureaucrats resembled, excuse me, assembled at that Congress had had warning signals of a coming storm, and they began to respond to these signals. The uprising of the East German workers in June 1953 that was followed a month later by a general strike at, of the For, Forkuta slave labor camp, these tremendous actions dot, 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 gave notice of a coming revolutionary storm, just as the general strike movement of the Russian workers in 1905 gave notice of the first revolution against the Tsar. End quote. Canon. In addition to... Excuse me. Where am I? The hell? Thus, the Socialist Workers' Party leaders saw the events of the 20th Congress as a confirmation of their long-held dogma that the Soviet workers would inevitably rise in political revolution against the Stalinist bureaucracy. This line of reasoning seems still further confined to the uprisings in Hungary and Poland, particularly in Hungary, in October to November 1956. Murray Weiss well stated the position of the Socialist Workers' Party, quote, with the revelations emanating from the 20th Congress and the revolutionary ferment in Eastern Europe, Poznan in June 1956, the October days in Poland, the October-November insurrection in Hungary, the bureaucratic equilibrium of the communist parties throughout the world was irreparably disrupted, dot, dot, dot. In our opinion, the revolutionary upsurge of the Soviet orbit working class is in its first stages. The struggle is bound to spread and become more intense. The working class and youth in the Soviet Union itself are heading for open mass struggle. The goal of this struggle is the overthrow of the Soviet bureaucracy and the restoration of workers' democracy on the foundation of the socialized property forms established by the October 1917 revolution. End quote. Quote, Regroupment, end quote. The disintegration of the U.S. Communist Party, which resulted from the events of 1956, seemed to the Socialist Workers' Party leaders to give Trotskyism a new chance to recruit from the ranks of the Stalinist and the Stalinist periphery. They gave the name, quote, regroupment, end quote, to these efforts, and it lasted for about two years. The first indication of dissension within the Communist Party became apparent when the Daily Worker, then edited by John Gates, opened its pages to comments and criticisms of what had happened and was continuing to happen in, in 1956. The, resu the result was an outpouring of criticisms of Stalinism, the Soviet and East European regimes, and other things which the Communists had, had until then held to be sacrosanct. These exchanges had several results. Some of the intellectuals who had been in or around the Communist Party broke away, the most notable figure to do so being the novelist Howard Fast. 
Another effect was the launching of a factional fight within the Communist Party, the first one in more than a quarter of a century, between the dissident groups surrounding John Gates and the hardliners headed by William Z. Foster. Most of the dissident leaders were people who had been the leaders of the Young Communist League in the 1930s. They controlled not only the Daily Worker, but the New York State Party organization. <laughs> However, after several months of conflict, the Fosterites won out, recapturing control of the party in New York and suppressing the Daily Worker when they could not gain control of it. Those who did left the Communist Party in 1956-57, to 57, did not form a separate organization. For several years, they stayed unaffiliated, making contacts with various other left-wing organizations and parties, but in most cases not joining any of them. It was these people whom the Socialist Workers' Party leaders were particularly anxious to gather into their ranks, as well as people who had been in the periphery of the Communist Party. In Henry Wallace's Progressive Party and the American Labor Party, in New York, and who were equally disillusioned in the Stalinism in, with which they had worked so long. When the suggestion of, quote, regroupment, end quote, was first put forward, the Socialist Workers' Party sought any realignment on the left which might give rise to a new party, including itself and other elements which might be attracted to it to be brought about on a, quote, principled, end quote, basis. A resolution launching the policy of seeking regroupment published by the National Committee of the Socialist Workers' Party on January 11, 1957, noted that, quote, two different ways of proceeding are counterposed. One, shall we first attempt a general a general unification, leaving the discussion and clarification of programmatic questions for a later time? Or two, shall we first explore the different views, clarify the various positions, and try to reach agreement and unification on at least the minimum fundamentals? It seems to us that the latter procedure is preferable and that the serious elements taking part in the discussion will agree that programmatic issues have to be considered and clarified before durable organizational conclusions can be reached." End quote. At a meeting in Los Angeles on the 1st of March, 1958, Cannon stated the objective which he and other Socialist Workers' Party leaders had in mind in their, regroup, quote, recruitment, end quote, campaign. Cannon said that, quote, the basic aim in rebuilding for the future, dot, 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 the basic aim for which we are all striving is to regroup the scattered socialist forces and eventually to get all honest socialists together in one common party organization, end quote. He added, quote, that can't be done in a day. The experience of the last two years showed that it will take time. We'll have to take the process of collaboration and unification in stages one step at a time, end quote. James P. Cannon. In the previous year, Cannon had defined the limits within which the Socialist Workers' Party was seeking, quote, regroupment, end quote. Cannon noted that, quote, I say we will not put the socialist movement of this country on the right track and restore its rightful appeal to the best sentiments of the working class of this country and above all to the young until we begin to call socialism by its right names at the great, as the great teachers did. Until we make it clear that we stand for an ever-expanding workers' democracy as the only road to socialism, until we root out every vestige of Stalinist perversion and corruption of the meaning of socialism and democracy, dot, 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 end quote. Cannon went on to claim that, quote, the privileged bureaucratic caste everywhere is the most formidable obstacle to democracy, to democracy and socialism. The struggle of the working class in both sections of the now divided world has become, in the most profound meaning of the term, a struggle against the usurpation, usurping privileged by bureaucracy. In the Soviet Union, it is a struggle to restore the genuine workers' democracy established by the Revolution of 1917, end quote. Therefore, he argued, quote, there is no sense in talking about regroupment with people who don't agree on that, on defense and support of the Soviet workers against the Soviet bureaucrats, end quote. However, Cannon noted, In 
that in that quote in the United States the struggle for workers' democracy is pre- pre- preeminently a struggle of the rank and file to gain democratic control of their own organizations. Dot dot dot. No party in this country has a right to call itself socialist unless it stands four square for the rank and file workers of the United States against the bureaucrats. End quote. Cannon concluded that, quote, in my opinion, effective and principled regroupment of socialist forces requires full agreement on these two points. That is the necessary starting point, end quote. Some months earlier, Farrell Dobbs, National Secretary of the Socialist Workers' Party, had stated a somewhat long list of, quote, positions basic to a revolutionary socialist program, end quote, which should serve as the basis of regroupment. These positions were, quote, defense of the worker states and the colonial revolution against imperialism, support to the workers' political revolution against the Stalinist bureaucracy in the Soviet sphere, formation of an independent labor party in opposition to the capitalist parties, dot, 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 quote, a class struggle policy in the unions and a working class policy in, so- in support of the Negro struggle for civil rights, defense of civil liberties for all, including members of the Communist Party, build a revolutionary socialist party based on class struggle principles, end quote. Farrell Dobbs. Regroupment in New York. This, quote, regroupment, end quote, was pushed most energetically and for a time successfully in New York State. The effort centered on the general election of 1958. It started when the Socialist Workers' Party took out an advertisement in the February 3rd, 1958 issue of the National Guardian, until then a Stalinist fellow traveling weekly. This advertisement proposed a, quote, United Socialist ticket for 1958, end quote. The Socialist Workers' Party suggested five points as the basis for such a campaign. The first stated that, quote, socialism offers a realistic alternative to the insane drive towards thermonuclear war, which the two parties of big business have been conducting, dot, 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 end quote. Point two argued that, quote, socialism offers the only permanent solution to the problem of capitalist depression, dot, 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 end quote. The third argument was that, quote, socialism can realize the full equality and brotherhood of all races and nationalities, dot, 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 end quote. The fourth point suggested by the Socialist Workers' Party proved to be the most controversial one that, quote, socialism stands for the deepening and extension of democracy, repeal the witch hunt legislation at home and free such political prisoners as Morton Sobel, Gil Green, Henry Winston, and Irving Potash. For political freedom throughout the Soviet bloc, and the ballot restrictions on minority parties in the United States, end quote. Finally, the Socialist Workers' Party called for a united socialist platform and stated that, quote, socialists favor the building of a labor party based on the unions and would urge a party to adopt a socialist program, dot, 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 against the support of capitalist parties and candidates for independent political action, end quote. As a result of this overture, United Independent so- a, excuse me, a United Independent Socialist Conference was finally held in New York City from June 13th to 15th, 1958. Three elements were represented: the Socialist Workers Party, the Communist Party, and the ex-Stalinist fellow travelers group around the National Guardian. Sam Botone, B O T T O N E writing in the Shackmanite periodical Labor Action, estimated that in the key vote of the meeting, 100 Socialist Workers Partiers participated, 60 from the Communist Party, and 80 from those associated with the National Guardian. The major issue of the meeting was whether to run a full slate of state candidates, five in all, or just to run a symbolic nominee for the Senate. The Trotskyists favored a full slate, hoping that the new group's candidate for governor might get the 50,000 votes necessary, according to state law, to give it official recognition as a party. 
the communists favored a symbolic, quote, peace, end quote, candidate for senator and no other nominees. In a showdown, the vote was 154 for a full slate against 61 for a single candidacy. There was no full discussion of a platform for the new United Independent Socialist Party. A, quote, draft, end quote, of the platform was presented by the steering committee, with no amendments being allowed from the floor. It was agreed that some modifications might be made clear by a, quote, continuations committee, end quote, elected by the conference. Sam Batone commented on the platform that, quote, represents that the platform, quote, represents a retreat from an inadequate minimal statement of the Socialist Workers' Party in its call for a united socialist ticket in the 1958 elections, dot, dot, dot. There is included a statement calling for, quote, political freedom throughout the Soviet bloc, end quote, end quote. However, no such statement appeared in the program. The Socialist Workers' Party was not represented at the head of the new group's ticket. The candidate for the senator was Corliss Lamont, a very f close fellow traveler of the Communist Party, and the nominees for governor, excuse me, the nominee for governor was John McManus of the National Guardian. The failure to include any criticism of the Soviet Union in the platform caused some dissension in Trotskyist ranks during the campaign. It provoked the resignation from the state campaign committee of Richard DeHaan, ex-chairman of the new youth group associated with the Socialist Workers' Party, the Young Socialist Alliance. In his statement of resignation, he complained that, quote, the platform and ideological character of the ISP do not differ ma materially from those of the Communist Party and the American Labor Party, I think it's what ALP means, ALP in past years. The platform carries not the least word suggesting anything but elation over the barbarous Stalinist policies of past and present, dot, 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 end quote. However, the concessions of the Independent Socialist Party to the Stalinists did not save the Trotskyists from attacks by the Communist Party. On the 2nd of November 1958, the worker, the weekly successor to the daily worker, complained that, quote, the worker, the Trotskyites consciously and some other people mistakenly have narrowed the fight for peace to the acceptance of a full socialist ticket. It is an extremely unfortunate and harmful development that the peace question is being turned into a narrow partisan issue to help win 50,000 votes for its gubernatorial candidate Jack McManus, excuse me, McManus, rather than a mass people's peace vote for Dr. Corliss Lamont for the United States Senate, end quote. The writer William Albertson added, quote, this policy of narrowing peace for an acceptance of socialism flows logically from the Trotskyite line, end quote, and that, quote, the socialist workers' partiers need a new, excuse me, want a new socialist party, which would be dominated by the Trotskyites and would become a new anti-Soviet agency to mislead people ready to move in the direction of socialism and of the Communist Party, end quote. The 1958 electoral effort provided few lasting results. The United Independent Socialist Committee, the, quote, continuous committee, continuations committee, end quote, of the June 1958 conference, finally announced its dissolution on the October 29th, 1959, quote, because of substantial differences over electoral policy in 1960, end quote. The Young Socialist Alliance. The only really lasting result of the, quote, regroupment, end quote, policy of the Socialist Workers' Party after the events of 1966, excuse me, I think it's supposed to say 56, was the alliance of the, the establishment of the Young Socialist Alliance. This development gave the Trotskyists a functioning youth organization for the first time since most of the Socialist Workers' Party youth had deserted the party with the Shackmanites in 1940. Most of the leaders of the Socialist Workers' Party were skeptical, perhaps on the basis...
of past experience about the possibility of adv or advisability of reestablishing a party youth group. However, Mira Tanner Weiss, during a nationwide speaking trip for the party in 1956, became convinced that not only was it necessary, but also possible for the Socialist Workers' Party to do so. She became one of the major it figures in the party who helped foster the establishment of a new Trotskyist youth organization. Several other events created an atmosphere conducive to the establishment of the new youth group. One of these was the dissolution of the youth, Labor Youth League. This was the youth group of the Communist Party, which was mo which had, was much influenced by the Gatesite wing of the Communist Party in the 1956 to 57 struggle. It was finally officially dissolved by the Communist Party in 1957. However, a number of its leaders and members continued to be interested in radical activities and were conducive to merging in the formation of a new youth organization. Another propitious development for the Socialist Workers' Party was the final struggle inside the Shackmanite Independent Socialist League and its youth affiliate, the Young Socialist League, over entry of the Shackmanites into the Socialist Party Social Democratic Federation. The majority of the Young Socialist League went along with entry and came into in time to form the majority in the SP SDF youth group, the Young People's Socialist League. However, a minority of the Young Socialist League, led by Tom Wolforth and James Robertson, opposed entry into the Young People's Socialist League. They urged instead, quote, unity with all socialist youth in an independent movement with a genuinely socialist program, end quote. They were finally expelled from the Young Socialist League, in the fall of 1957, but maintained a separate existence around a newly launched newspaper, Young Socialist. Even before the expulsion of the Young Socialist minority, the Socialist Workers' Party had organized a small youth group in New York City under the name of American Youth for Socialism, AYS. In May 1957, it sent an open letter to the Young Socialist League, in which it said that, quote, in our opinion, the position put forward by the Young Socialist League left-wing caucus provides the basis for beginning the long and necessary work of constructing a united revolutionary youth movement in this country. The AYS proposes that we begin the process of youth recruitment by the affiliation of the young members and sympathizers of the Socialist Workers' Party to the Young Socialist League, or... Is it the Youth Socialist League? Shit. What am I saying? Am I saying youth or young? Young Socialist League, I'm right. Alright, so the American Youth for Socialism proposes that we begin the process of youth recruitment by the affiliation of the young members and sympathizers of the Socialist Workers' Party to the Young Socialist League. Dot, 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 end quote. Although this proposal of the American Youth for Socialism group was obviously not accepted by the Young Socialist League. When the left-wing caucus of the organization was expelled, the ex shackmanite youth did gravitate towards the Socialist Workers' Party. Tim Wolferth, among others, began to write in the periodicals of the Socialist Workers' Party. However, it took two and a half years before a new organization finally emerged. The founding conference of the Young Socialist Alliance met in April 1960 in Philadelphia. It claimed that groups from 16 college campuses, as well as, quote, students in high schools and trade schools and young workers in industry, end quote, were represented by 75, quote, regular alternative and fraternal delegates, end quote. Groups from Los Angeles, San Francisco, Berkeley, Seattle, Denver, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Chicago, Detroit, Milwaukee, Boston, Baltimore, Connecticut, Newark, New York, and Philadelphia attended. The 
The report on the founding meeting of the YSA and the militant said that, quote, the conference explicitly confined the Marxist program of the young socialist, excuse me, explicitly defined the young, the Marxist program of the young socialist alliance. While it remained and even strengthened all the features of an independent organization of youth with its own unique requirements and tasks in bringing socialist ideas to the new generation, it adopted a stand of, quote, basic political solidarity on the principles of revolutionary socialism with the Socialist Workers' Party, end quote, end quote. It also noted that, quote, the conference warmly greeted the decision of the Socialist Workers' Party to run Feral Dobbs for president and Myra Tanner Weiss for vice president in the 1960 elections and pledged full support to this campaign, end quote. One second. Um, Tim Wolferth was elected national chairman of the Young Socialist Alliance, and Jim Lembrecht was named its national secretary. Among the adult speakers at the meeting were Otto Nathan, the economist, Dr. Annette T. Rubenstein, who had been candidate for lieutenant governor on the Socialist Workers' Party-backed independent socialist ticket in, November, in New York in 1958, as well as Farrell Dobbs and Myra Tanner Weiss. One second. The Young Socialist Alliance was to prove long-lasting. It was able to take advantage of the new left wave of the 1960s and at least during some of the 1970s was to be the largest radical youth group in the country. The Workers' World Schism Near the end of the 1950s, the Socialist Workers' Party suffered another split which, although nowhere near the concept consequence of those of the Shackmanites and Cochranites earlier, did result in the establishment of a small but persistent rival group, the Workers' World Party. This was the element in the 1953 majority led by Sam Marcy. Sam Marcy had for some time been somewhat of a maverick within the Socialist Workers' Party. However, Sam Marcy, excuse me, however, it was over the events of 1956 that Sam Marcy and his followers developed fundamental disagreements with the rest of the Socialist Workers' Party. Sam Marcy argued that the uprisings in Poland and Hungary were not, as the rest of the Socialist Workers' Party leaders saw them, the first expressions of the long yearned for workers' revolts against Stalinist bureaucrats, but rather were counter revolutionary movements. Sam Marcy and his friends welcomed the re entry of the Soviet army into Hungary. By early 1959, the Marcyites were outside the Socialist Workers' Party and had founded an organization of their own, the Workers' World Party. Its official organ was Workers' World, the same name as a periodical that James Cannon had edited 30 years before. In an early issue of the newspaper, an editorial proclaimed that, quote, We are the Trotskyists. We stand 100% with all the principled positions of Leon Trotsky, the most revolutionary communist since Lenin, end quote. If nothing else, the Workers' World Party were m marked people were marked by unbounded enthusiasm and optimism. Their outlook was epitomized by a letter to the editor published in the March 18, 1960 issue of Workers' World. 
It said that, quote, after attending the workers' world meeting in New York, dot, 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 I know socialism is coming. There's no stopping the world revolution. As the workers' world party reaches out to more workers, the workers all over the world, especially in the colonial countries, are fighting back for freedom, dot, dot, dot. The workers' world party is the only party which can and will lead the world revolution, end quote. However, in spite of all the early allegiance of the Workers' World Party to Trotskyism, it soon wandered from that position. One of its leaders wrote 17 years after its establishment that, quote, the founding of Workers' World Party in 1959 signified the emergence of a tendency in the U.S. that championed all the socialist countries, seeking through its press to educate the most advanced elements here on the earth-shaking changes being wrought in that part of the world that had seemed to be mired in social stagnation. In the very first issue of this newspaper, March 1959, a front-page article hailed the Chinese communes, which were being treated as utopian by many on the left, dot, 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 end quote. Yeah, when I think of World, Workers' World Party, I don't think of Trotskyism. Um, Because the Workers' World Party soon ceased any pretense of being an orthodox Trotskyist group, we shall not trace its further evolution here. However, in a chapter discussing the various offshoots of Trotskyism in the United States, we shall discuss its later history. Recapitulation of the Socialist Workers' Party in the 1950s on balance, the decade of the 1950s was probably the most difficult one in the history of Trotskyism in the United States. Although he counterbalanced certain words of optimism against his description of the situation in those years, James Cannon, better perhaps than anyone else, has described the travails through which the Trotskyists had passed. Speaking in 1958, Cannon said that, quote, Now, we socialists don't need to conceal our own troubles. We have plenty of them. We who have survived the storms of these last terrible years know very well that we have been hurt, dot, dot, dot. First, there were the terrible reactionary effects on the labor movement and in all American radicalism and even liberal thought of the Second World War, the Cold War that followed it, and the Korean War, the effects were reactionary in all directions. Then we had to contend with the conservatizing influence of the long, artificially popped up, propped up prosperity, which sapped the strength of American radicalism in all its departments. And then we had to put up with the devastation and terror of the long witch hunt, which decimated the ranks of American radicalism and liberalism and all sections of the socialist movement. And then, last but not least, the socialist movement has been sapped by a moral sickness, the calculated lies and slanders, the suppression of free and independent thought, the violation of class solidarity, the disruption of fraternal relations and free discussion among socialists of different tendencies. All this dirty business has worked to demoralize the movement and to discredit the name of socialism. We have been hit hard from all sides, dot, 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 end quote. 